All right, let's walk through CSS Grid together. From the core concepts like grid containers and items, through basic usage, advanced techniques, and finally making it all responsive. Now, when working with Grid for layouts, many people think it's very similar to Flexbox. But here's the interesting part. The module that's actually most similar to Grid is the HTML table. Both use columns and rows to arrange content, but Grid has so much more power because you can move elements anywhere you want, and it's much more optimized for responsive design. Now, let's dive into Grid together. When working with CSS Grid, we start with the concept of a grid container. This refers to the parent element that wraps around all the items inside. This container is responsible for creating the grid model with its columns and rows. Here, I'm creating a container class that takes on this role. On the CSS side, we declare display grid. To manage the number of rows, we use the grid template rows property. Declaring as many values here will create that many rows. For example, I'll create three rows each with a height of 100 pixels and a fourth row at 50 pixels. Similarly, we create columns with grid template columns. I'll create three columns, each 100 pixels wide. And just like that, our grid has been created. Now, in some cases, you want to manage the remaining excess space. We can easily handle this with fraction units. If I add a fourth column with a value of one fraction, that remaining space becomes the fourth column. If there are multiple columns with fraction units, say I create fourth and fifth columns both at one fraction, the remaining space divides equally between them. To make our code more concise, we can use the repeat function. For example, I can declare repeat with the first parameter as 3 and the second as 100 pixels to create three rows of 100 pixels each. The same works for columns. So if I want a 5x5 five five grid, I'll use repeat to create five rows of 100 pixels each and again use repeat for five columns of 100 pixels each. Now grid items refer to the actual items inside our grid container. This is the website content we need to arrange. Notice our grid model creates these quadrilaterals inside, and each one represents the default position for an item. Items arrange in order from left to right. The first item goes in the first quadrilateral, then the second and third items fill the next positions. When we run out of quadrilaterals in a row, the next item moves to the next row, and so on. Thanks to this default grid behavior, for simple designs we can arrange elements using only the grid template properties without any extra work. Here's a specific example. With three items, if I want the first item to be 100 pixels wide, I just set the first column to 100 pixels. The second item gets 200 pixels because it's in the second column position, and likewise for the third item. If I want the third item to move to the second row, I just set the total number of columns to 2. Based on the grid template rows property, I can set item 1's height to 250 pixels, and item 3 in row 2 also to 250 pixels. With this method, we can create layouts without needing anything beyond the grid model, though it's best for simpler interfaces where the default item order works for us. Now, how do we move items to different locations? Let's say I want to move item 3 to the fourth column. I simply use the grid column property with a value of 4. It's that straightforward. If you want to move it to any column, just enter the column number. The same goes for moving between rows using the grid rows property. To change an item's size, grid column can take a second parameter. This parameter equals the current position plus the number of columns you want to span. So if I start at column 3 and want to span 2 columns, I calculate 3 plus 2, making the second parameter 5. The same logic applies to grid rows. The second parameter is the current row position plus the number of rows to span. If I'm at row 2 and want to span 3 rows, that's 2 plus 3, so the value becomes 5. This makes resizing any element quite intuitive. Similarly, I can move the second item to the fifth column in the first row, spanning two rows high. I can move item one to the second column, spanning two columns wide, moving to the second row, and also spanning two rows tall. Now you'll notice item three overlaps part of item one. This answers the question, can we make items overlap in grid like with CSS position? Yes, by default, when items overlap, whichever comes later in the HTML appears on top. If you want to change this, use the Z-index property. Any item without a declared Z-index defaults to zero. So if I want item one to overlap item three, I give item one a Z-index of one. If I want item three on top instead, its Z-index needs to be higher than item one's, say two. 
When we level up our grid usage, we encounter the powerful grid area tools. At the basic level, grid area can replace grid columns and grid rows. For example, grid area takes four values. The first represents grid row begin, the second is grid column begin, then grid row end, and finally grid column end. At this point, I can replace all my grid column and grid row values with a single grid area declaration. But the special power of grid area goes much further. Here's another way to use it. In each item, you declare the grid area property with any unique value. Now each item has an area identifier. From now on, when you need to edit positions or sizes, you don't manipulate each item individually. Instead, you work with the grid container via the grid template areas property. This attribute excels at managing layout through predefined areas. Let me show you how this works. We have five columns and five rows, so my grid area will have five values. Each dot represents one column. Since we have five rows, I'll repeat this pattern five times. Now to position any element, I just use its area name instead of the dots in the corresponding column and row positions. For example, if I want item three in the first row and first column, I replace that positions dot with item three. Similarly, I can place item two in the second row and second column and item one right below item two. Everything becomes much simpler and more intuitive to use. Resizing is equally straightforward. If I want item two to span two columns wide, I just replace the dots in the next column with item two as well. If I want it taller, I replace item two in the next row too. Everything becomes extremely simple because we're not calculating line numbers. We're visually arranging named areas. We just change the dots representing specific rows and columns, and elements immediately move to their new positions. The most special aspect of this approach is how it optimizes responsive design. Without grid template areas, when elements need to change position or size across breakpoints, we have to edit each item's grid column and grid row values individually. But with grid template areas, everything we need to edit stays in this one property. To better understand this, let's look at some responsive examples. First responsive example, I have multiple items representing product cards. The container class wraps them, so to arrange these I'll create a grid from the container class. I'll create four columns, each 250 pixels wide, and use Justify Content Center to push content to the middle. I'll set the gap between columns and rows to 20 pixels. But when the screen size changes to something smaller, you'll notice the design breaks because there isn't enough space for all four columns. This is where we need responsive adjustments. Before I share a really useful tip, let's try the traditional approach first. We check the current screen width. If it's less than or equal to 1024 pixels, typical iPad and tablet sizes, I'll divide into three columns instead. Similarly, at 767 pixels, typical phone sizes, I'll use just two columns. This approach works, but it takes considerable effort across multiple breakpoints. Here's a better way. Instead of manually changing column counts for each screen size, we can use autofill with the repeat function. When we combine repeat with autofill, the number of columns becomes completely automatic. The system checks how many columns can fit comfortably at the current screen size, and with smaller screens, the column count automatically reduces to keep your design looking beautiful. For our next example, I have a series of elements inside a main element where, according to the responsive design, these elements will change size and move around without consistent patterns. How do we solve this? Coming back to the CSS, remember the advanced customization we discussed with grid template areas? This is where we see its outstanding advantages. For each element, I'll declare a different grid area value to name its area. Once completed, I go to the main element, our grid container. For the desktop design, I'll divide it into three equal columns and four rows, with the fourth row set to auto because we don't know what the content height will be. After creating the grid, I use grid template area to simulate the grid framework. The three dots represent three columns, repeated four times for our four rows. Then I simply replace all the specific areas into their corresponding columns and rows, and it's done. When we get to other screens like tablet and mobile, Thanks to using grid area, we don't need to edit each individual element. We simply call the main element again, edit the column and row parameters, and use grid template area to rebuild the layout. This makes the responsive design process extremely concise, clean, easy to read, and free from conflicts. 
and that's everything about grid in CSS. If you found this interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel for more helpful videos. If you have any questions, leave a comment and I'll do my best to answer. I'd also love to hear your suggestions for what topics we should cover next. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again in the next video.